Hello, I'm Laura Cassidy from the American Medical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from ACS's 256th National Meeting and Exposition in Boston. We're joined today by Dr. Ayushman Sen from the Pennsylvania State University. He's studying nanobot pumps that can destroy nerve agents. Dr. Sen? Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> so we have been studying enzymes, and enzymes are naturally occurring catalysts that facilitate chemical reactions. Um, our bodies have hundreds of enzymes doing all kinds of chemical reactions in our bodies. And <clears throat> they're very, very efficient. So they, for example, uh, depending on the enzyme, can cause reactions of hundreds of thousands of molecules per second. So all this was known. What we found out uh, was that <clears throat> uh, when enzymes facilitate the reaction, um, they generate mechanical force. And <clears throat> as you can see there, if you um, attach the enzyme to a support, this force gets transmitted to the fluid. So in a sense, they become nanofluidic pumps. Uh, and the speed at which they pump the fluid depends on how much of the uh, chemical is present, the fuel that's present, if you will. And so there are a number of things you can do with these, these things. You can use them uh, for drug delivery. You, know, you can use them to neutralize nerve agents. So in this particular case, uh, if we have an enzyme that decomposes nerve agents, and there are enzymes that will do that, uh, then two things happen. One is, is it's decomposing the nerve agent, but that's the fuel f for the pump. And so while it's destroying the nerve agent, it's also f fueling and powering the fluid flow. And so what you can do is uh, you can attach the enzyme to a reservoir. It can be a gel, just like jello. Uh, and you can fill the reservoir with an antidote and have the enzyme attached to this gel. And so what happens is if it sees the nerve agent, it starts pumping. And it's a self-powered pump because the nerve agent is the fuel for this. Uh, and so it destroys the nerve agent, it pumps fluid, and the fluid pumping can push out uh, any antidote that you might have in the reservoir. So it's a, it's a one-two punch, if you will. It's um, destroying the nerve agent, using it as a fuel, and pumping out antidote. <clears throat> so I'll be happy to take questions. Would you like to show the video? Oh, yes, okay. right. Uh, so if you go back one. Okay. So um, this is an enzyme that was prepared at the Edgewood uh, facility uh, of the US Army. Um, and it uh, is effective against a broad range of nerve agents. Uh, and so one of the things we do, as I said, is we'll attach it to a surface. Now, of course, Water, you can't see water flow easily, so we put little tracer particles uh, so that uh, they, they move when the water flows, and that way you know how fast it's flowing. So this is a cartoon of the enzyme, uh, and that's a sarin uh, mimic, uh, and it uh, causes the decomposition of the sarin mimic. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, <clears throat> and if you click on the video, uh, what you see is, oops, I'm sorry. Go back. If you click on the video. Yep. Oh, why does it keep doing that? Anyway, <laughs> so the video. There we go. Yeah. You can see the tracer particles uh, move, so this shows the fluid pumping. And on your left, what you have is a graph of the pumping speed versus the concentration of this nerve agent mimic, and as you see more nerve agent you have, faster is the flow. So it's, it's sort of commensurate with how much nerve agent you have that it pumps out the antidote. So if you have very little nerve agent, then only a small amount of antidote is pumped out. If you have a lot of nerve agent, 
uh, then more antidote is pumped out. So, so we did all this at Penn State, and then we shipped this thing uh, to the Edgewood site where they actually tested it with Soman, which is one of the nasty nerve agents, and it works just fine. Very good. Are there any questions? Please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. Hi, so it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Um, can you say how you would envisage these might be administered and um, what tests have you done so far? In, have you done any tests in animals or anything like that? No, we have not. We have focused mainly on the fundamentals. Um, but obviously, that's the next step. How would you administer this? And one can uh, visualize several different ways to do it. One would be in the form of an ointment, uh, where the, uh, the soldier in question can uh, put it on the skin. Uh, and nerve agents are liquids, and so they're uh, delivered as droplets. So when these droplets will land on the, uh, the ointment, that will turn on the pump. Uh, and, and then, of course, it'll get destroyed. And if, if you want to have antidote in the ointment, it'll get released. So that's one possible way you can, you can do it. And when do you envisage you'd be able to, I mean, these tests presumably have just been on samples in the lab. Right. Is the next stage to go to animal models as well? Do you plan to do any animal uh, studies? The next step is actually to find a good architecture to do the delivery. Uh, and once we figure that out, then yes, obviously you, you would want to go to an animal model, yes. And can you just explain what causes the pumping action? Just what exactly <coughs> is it that, that um, um, generates the flow? So. Uh, that's a bit of a complicated story, but let me try to explain it as best as I can. So the enzymes have protein molecules, and they're flexible. And uh, when they um, catalyze reactions or facilitate reactions, they deform. Um, so they go, if you will, like this. Uh, and, and that pushes out the fluid. Uh, and of course, one enzyme an enzyme is a nanometer size. One enzyme is no good, but uh, since they're so small, you can have millions of them on a very small patch, and then you can have significant fluid flow. <clears throat> when you say significant fluid flow, so how? So we're talking, in, in this case, um, in the lab, we're talking many microns per second uh, fluid flow. So okay. that's the speed of the fluid. Uh, in a chamber, and our chambers are usually uh, up to a centimeter in size each way. And how fast acting is it against the? Uh, the nerve oh, it's agent? well, it's it's immediate. As I said, these en most enzymes are really fast. They will cause the destruction of hundreds of thousands of molecules per second. So these are really really fast enzymes. Um, and so, it, as soon as it sees it, it'll start the pump. When there's no, no nerve agent left, it stops because there's no fuel left. And the enzymes, um, are they naturally occurring in the body? Is it, is there, it there are some that are naturally occurring. The one that I showed you uh, was developed at Edgewood by uh, genetic engineering, uh, but but there are also naturally occurring enzymes. So it depends on how efficient you want them. Uh, the natural occurring enzymes would also destroy the nerve agents. They are a little bit slower. This one was made specifically for a class of nerve agents. Yeah. And I was thinking, because these are sort of immobilized enzymes, but yes. I think of nanobots, I was tending to think of things that move around. Well, they, 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 if, we immobilize it because of the ap particular application. If you don't immobilize them, they actually move. Um, so, and they move and they will seek out the nerve agents and, and uh, do whatever you want them to so do. So that could be used you for know, if, different if they've actually application. been in, in, internally yeah. taken. Yes. It, and also for drug delivery, I was thinking. So how far have you got with sort of um, so, maybe as a... 
I don't, uh, could you take them in by ingestion or something? Um, so uh, one of the things, well, so one of the things we have published already is you can put um, an enzyme called glucose oxidase, which is a naturally occurring enzyme in your body, um, and it, it uses glucose as fuel. And so you can attach glucose oxidase um, to a gel. You can fill the gel with insulin, and, and if you put it in solution where there's glucose, for example, your blood, uh, it'll pump, and it'll pump depending, the f speed of the pumping will depend on how much glucose you have in the blood, and that in turn will then regulate how much insulin is pumped out. Um, so in that case, one could imagine implanting it uh, in your body, uh, and from time to time, of course, you will have to replenish the insulin when it's used up. Uh, so that's, that's one way of doing it. The, the, what you suggested, which is an interesting one, is just put the enzyme in the blood and have them go to where the nerve agent is. Um, I'm not sure that that's going to be fast enough because by that time, damage may have been done to the skin and all the other uh, organs. Um, and so, but but it, that's definitely a possibility to use them um, to move and seek out the nerve agent. Yes. Can you optimize the enzymes? I was just thinking in terms of the delivery applications and things like this. Is it possible to well, there are two ways. the enzymes? Well, yes. So there are two ways you can optimize it. One is, of course, you can optimize the enzyme itself by genetic engineering. Um, but the other optimization is, you know, what kind of a gel architecture do you want? Um, how do you attach the enzyme? What kind of a gel do you want as a reservoir? And that would vary from drug to drug and antidote to antidote. <coughs> okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Bela uh, Buslik, ACS. Um, the example you're using generates hydrogen fluoride, uh, and of course you've got to get rid of that, yeah, uh, yeah, that yeah, yeah. Uh, since most fluorides yeah, are yeah. quite toxic. Right. But uh, some of the nerve agents, are, of course, work uh, of enzymes that are present in the body that uh, where they bind to the, uh, to the enzyme. And if you pick an enzyme that uh, in, you, uh, in your nanopump, yeah. you, you, you Essentially, saturate the enzyme, and then uh, then it's go uh, it's going to stop. What what uh, are you figuring on on kind of a chain reaction in there in there with more than one enzyme uh, in in the in the pump? So uh, the products actually get eliminated because because once you, once you essentially block the pump or or the enzyme, it's gone. That, that's an excellent point. So, so as you correctly pointed out, depending on the enzyme, you can go from a really toxic nerve agent to something that's less toxic but nevertheless toxic. And then you need a second enzyme to then convert that to something uh, uh, less toxic even. Um, there is nothing that stops you. So every enzyme you've looked at, when they cause a reaction, causes pumping. And so, for example, on a gel, um, there's nothing that stops you from putting in the, the whole range of enzymes uh, so that one enzyme feeds on the previous one and so on. And we, we have looked at en enzyme cascades where, in fact, enzyme A produces something that the enzyme B feeds on or uses as fuel, and enzyme produces something that enzyme C feeds on or uses as fuel. Uh, and that's, that's absolutely possible. Well, I, I, I just kind of had that because I, I, I noticed the hydrogen fluoride yeah, and, uh, yeah, that, yeah. that kind of stuck yeah, out. Now, right. I can imagine attaching something like calcium or something yeah, of the sort that, yeah, uh, yeah, that will yeah, essentially yeah, tie yeah, up the, uh, the, yeah. the fluorine. Uh, but then, again, uh, you have surfaces that are covered with calcium ca uh, phosphate, and then, uh, then uh, you, you've got nowhere to put the, the product. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what what kind of turnover? What what kind of speeds are you getting out of? I um, so of a better term. So the um, typical enzymes that we have used um, will, um, depending on the enzyme, of course, um, 
their rates vary, vary from uh, 10 to the 5, so that's about um, 100,000 molecules per second all the way down to maybe 100 molecules per second. So they're, they're, they're relatively fast enzymes, yeah. And, and when, when you've got these, uh, these things, you, you eventually want to clear it from the body. How do you eliminate all, uh, all these, these so, nanobots? Or, uh, uh, so, so that's why, uh, that's why I, as, as the previous uh, person asked, I, I would rather put, put it on my skin as an ointment than inject it into my bloodstream um, okay. or, or put it as an implant rather than directly inject into the bloodstream because uh, that will require much, much more rigorous testing, uh, if you will, unless it's a naturally occurring enzyme. For example, there are phosphatases in your body, which will hydrolyze organophosphates, which are Norwegian. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that's yeah. that's kind of natural. But yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Katie Cottingham, ACS. So I'm wondering, how close are you to putting these nanobots on protective clothing for soldiers and people like that? Um, uh, well, so this this is this is funded partly by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, who are interested in neutralizing uh, these uh, nerve agents, um, and so they were our task was to find out the fundamentals of what causes the pumping, and one of the questions that was asked, and how, what is the best architecture for for doing these things. Um, the next level will have to be with, with bioengineers uh, and so on, uh, who are much better at doing the actual application than, than we are. Um, so that's, that's obviously the next step, yes. Are there any other questions? All right, if not, thank you, Dr. Sen. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly <clears throat> backslash ACS Live underscore Boston 2018. Please join us for our next press conference at 11 a.m. today on how e-cigarettes -cigar can damage DNA. Thank you.